Hi, welcome to Sport of the Nation. I'm your host, Mike Sham. Joining me today is a legend of South African cricket, <coughs> the one and only Mr. Finnegan Fani de Villiers. Fani, welcome to Sport of the Nation. It's so good to have you here, to yeah. see you again. Well, it's, it's good to have somebody with a bit of grey beard Jeez. and uh, grey hair that can remember what we used to do. In yeah, Adelaide. and it feels like just yesterday, but it, uh, the years move quickly, don't yeah, they? It's quite interesting. On the road, you, you find a lot of people uh, in offices, meetings, wherever, that uh, remind you of good games. Mm. And a funny thing has happened. Those guys are getting bloody older all the time. <laughs> Every single year they're older, that reminds me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I can promise anybody that's watching this uh, we definitely don't feel as old as we look. I can promise you that. So, uh, yep. Fani, let's just uh, let's let's go in today. We're talking uh, your fantastic life in cricket and your fantastic life in general because it's been multifaceted. You've had a couple of careers within uh, within that life, and I want to, you know, obviously, uh, to many people, you'll be remembered as the hero of Sydney, and we'll come back to that in a second. But. There was uh, an interesting story building up to to uh, your 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 international cricketing career, because I recall, and uh, as a as a mad keen cricket follower, and uh, you know that that you came you burst on the scene in the the mid 80s, sort of, at a strange time in South African cricket. Right, we were coming to grips with a very new thing, and it's it's been lost a bit in the mists of time. Cricket used to be almost solely a white English sport in South Africa. And suddenly, Northern Transvaal, as they were then, had this crop of young Afrikaans players, and you were one of the first. That was quite a rare thing back then. Yeah, I think um, I need to allude a little bit back, even before then, growing up on a farm in the Free State. Um, our schools suddenly uh, had access to and meaning access to, you're probably going to hear that a couple of times in, in this interview, where, where uh, uh, the schools became better at playing cricket, became better at playing uh, not just rugby, but uh, better at, at doing athletics, and most probably some of the other technical sports, mm -hmm. like um, tennis, for etc., that was also uh, school sports. In that. And, and you need to go back in time when that started happening. Yes. And if you go back to to the 31st of May 1960, um, when we became a republic of South Africa, of, I think I've got my history right, when we became a republic, um, for the first time, the Afrikaners had access to probably grants from the teaching department, grants from government, towards the English schools, because remember before then, even if the National Party took over in 48, it was still an English party. And I'm sure if you look at bursaries and support, and uh, allowances and whatever you want to call it towards schools, towards upbringing, towards education, towards uh, the education of sport, I'm sure it was, it was as evolution will do, it, had, it was probably given more to the English schools. So in 1960, when we, the Afrikaners, got into power, um, it changed. The schools got better. There were more grants for teachers to go on courses from the different athletics disciplines um, uh, right through to, to cricket fields being built. Um, I'm sure access to, to extra money to build the cricket facilities. And I was a recipient of one of those. Dad was uh, obviously a teacher, so he played a massive role in the De Villiers clan sport. And, and I think he was a very proactive individual, hence the reason that all of us were good sportsmen. Um, and we should actually talk about that later on People Think Talent. It's about getting access to, um, uh, developing skills. Um, and Dad made sure that our skills were developed. But it was in a new world, in a new South Africa, where you had more Afrikaners not living off, off the land anymore, um, getting into governmental posts. Uh, and that's exactly what, what's been happening to the Africans, obviously, in, since 1991, 92, 93. And suddenly you get access to bonds. You get access to, to uh, 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 buying houses in cities and towns uh, much easier than it was before, and, uh, and hence the reason of, of better schools. So I was a recipient of that, and uh, starting to study in 1982, 1983 rather, um, I became part of a tertiary institute through bursaries. Again, bursaries that was made available most probably more to Afrikaners than, than ever before. And, uh, and I was a keen young sportsman. Dad played a massive role. 
in mobilizing all of us. I was the youngest of five. Uh, that obviously paved the way for, for more skills being developed between the older brothers and sisters. Uh, and I was a recipient again of being at the right time at the right place in a tertiary institution that also most probably got more support from government in those days with our first overseas international cricket pro that came to coach us where we used to use teachers to coach us in the older days before me. Suddenly we had a Russell Cup from Leicestershire that became the professional of our club um, and money was awarded in that section to get him here and the history is obviously speaking for itself. A lot of young players then started getting access to better coaching, uh, better perceptions, better frame of references and, uh, and then you get to play. And I think it, it, I grew up in the time when cricket was completely English. Mm. Um, the Jewish guys and the English people uh, really took over. I think they, uh, they were, the, they were the, um, the perception of more money, mm. the perception of more opportunities when it comes to private coaching, etc., which is a technical sport, tennis, goal, mm. golf and cricket. If you don't do private coaching, you're going to get nowhere. If, you don't, if you're not going to become part of that. And uh, suddenly I burst onto the scene through a lot of gym work, a lot of extra fitness that, uh, that I had to do and, and a little bit of technical advice from, from people around me and uh, took a hell of a lot of wickets. And if I couldn't um, take the wicket uh, or the wickets or get them out, I literally bounced them out. <laughs> so uh, I burst onto the scene from a kind of a second league. Mm. From January onwards, we were allowed to play in the next, uh, in, the, in the higher league. Um, um, again, access for the first time to first league cricket. And I was seen and, and I was asked to play for Northern Transvaal B. Um, three bowlers got injured at the same time. A bowman ran over Franz of Edemans foot. Gerben Grobert pulled a, um, a, a knee out of with rugby training in between. Mike Clare, that came from Mattel, that used to come to the Army, Army days in our mm. part of the world, he pulled the ribcage. And I played B-side cricket the next weekend, A-side cricket. Okay. And uh, yes, it was under a bit of a cloud. But you weren't overly trusted eh, to come in there from uh, those lower reaches. Who's this guy? They didn't give you a lot of work in your first no, couple it, of games. No, eh? they didn't. <laughs> I, I actually played a couple of games without bowling a ball. I was a fast bowler, opening bowler, faster than anybody. Yeah. And I wasn't given the opportunity. Um, I can understand that in a way mm. because they don't know about me. And obviously provincial captains try and win games. Uh, and, and, and I had to prove myself in the nets. Uh, and work very hard and also with their advice to try and get better as soon as possible and evolve in the system as soon as possible. Um, I was lucky enough to be a recipient of, of two 10 Rand awards, which was the uh, fielding awards of two <laughs> matches. And the one game I didn't even bowl and I was the fielder of the evening. That's uh, why you got the award. Eh? Because <laughs> you were there so at least I did something <laughs> in those games. But uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, yeah. it, it, it was an evolution program uh, process that, that just started bearing the fruits yes. of Africana cricket and I'm sure you can remember a few. I do remember, I remember it well and I, the other thing that I remember that, that, that obviously uh, uh, let's call it your first career when you were a tear away fast bowler, you were hell of a quick with a wild action and it went, the ball came out at a thousand miles an hour and then you had a very very bad injury if I, if I remember correctly that forced a big change um i think i think the biggest injury that i had was probably uh cricket iq okay um yes i had a back up at an early age of my career and and uh, had to work around that but suddenly i realized that swing bowling is much more important than fast bowling i used to try i used to run in and and bowl as quick as i can um uh, and and uh, even fall a couple of times over after the delivery strike and then with the ball starting to swing, when, uh, when I got cleverer, with the help of the Anton Ferreras and the Antons and the guys, uh, the, some of the players that, that, that bowled a bit, <coughs> that kind of saw what's happening in, in county cricket that brought that into our system. Remember from 72 to 92, we were in the doldrums. Mm. Uh, Benson is yes, cricket was the best that you can do really. Yeah. And some of the rebel matches, obviously, when, when I was still a springbok with Clive Rice being the captain, um, and Jimmy Cook rather. So uh, um, with that little bit of advice, the ball started swinging and I realized as an inquisitive youngster, as a teachable youngster, and if you would ask me what are the most two important talents that the dear Lord's given me is to be inquisitive and to be teachable. 
um, uh, if you've got those two attributes, then you are going to get better and you're going to think about what's happening. So it's not all true if it came out of the media that is because of an injury that I started bowling slow. It was very much um, getting to understand the game better and, uh, and, and using that to the best of my ability to make it easier for taking wickets and knocking guys over. Well, I can remember as a, as, a, as a real enthusiast and somebody that watched a lot of cricket in that era, uh, this idea that uh, this f very quick Farney de Villiers was now bowling not quite as quick and he's a swing bowler was almost like, I don't think this is going to work. It didn't feel, you know, it didn't seem as an observer, and I'm sure most of the media and many of the pundits of the time, that this is going to be a more effective Farney de Villiers, mm -hmm. but it was. Um, I spoke a lot to players that, that kept on playing because I stopped playing in 1998 hmm. and I never knew what my pace was because we didn't yeah, have didn't the measure measurements in those days or we didn't have the machines or the, um, uh, uh, the support. And everybody said because in 1989 they started, 1998 they started, 1999 they started uh, measuring pace and everybody said I was Glenn McGrath's pace and Glenn McGrath was consistent. 138, 139, 137, now 138, 138, 139. And I was a, a, a exponent of a lot of gym work and enjoying that kind of fitness, the ego side probably of it, um, that made me bowl at that pace most of the time. And at that pace, I could swing the ball more than anything else uh, or any other pace. Even if I bowled slower, some, somehow my wrist wasn't in the right position. It started straightening up. And if I bowled quicker, the wrist also started straightening up, which means it wasn't in the perfect angle for swing bowling and um, I was lucky enough to to get to understand that early enough and I think with the likes of Lee Barnett and uh, the captain of Northerns in those days for a long time I think a lot a lot came my way a lot happened a lot uh, started making sense again coming out of a, not a cricket school out of a world that didn't have the likes of the coaching that our office probably had and, and the great college had, which was the only two Afrikaans mm. schools that I can think of that had a proper cricket program running, uh, all the likes of all the top English cricket schools. So it took me a little bit longer, but luckily I was thrown into the deep end and I was willing to learn. Yeah, so, you, you know, you started to, to, to get better and better at the swing bowling. Your control was, was improving dramatically and eventually I suppose that was your biggest attribute was your absolute control, you didn't bowl a lot of bad balls. You know, in, in county cricket, and I had a terrible season, uh, the one season I played, um, I took about 40 wickets here in a season, which was 10, 11 more than the next guy. Um, uh, I was always having a battle with uh, Thomas from England to try and be the most wicket taker, the biggest wicket taker in the season. And uh, got to England and I thought I'm going to show the boys they had a bad, they had a, a previous wet season, so they lowered the seam, made it a thinner threat, and made it smaller so the ball couldn't swing. And I taught myself to bowl off cutters, and uh, and also to try and, and and become stronger in that time because I couldn't really um, uh, get better at what I was doing. Um, but that extra gym work got me to swing the ball away. And in county cricket, a couple of times, if you if you had no result, you had to bowl to the wickets to see who can hit the wickets the most to win the game because they needed the points. I was never asked because I couldn't hit the wickets. Okay. And would you believe that? I mean, the action was so grooved that with a swing, I couldn't hit the wickets. And even if I was thinking to bowl outside leg stump to swing it into, I couldn't hit the flippin' wickets. <laughs> so I was never asked to, to, to at the end of those uh, um, scenarios to bowl at the death. And hence the reason that I was just the outside of stump bowler, from off stump to outside of stump. And so the action, the landing, the follow through, the muscle uh, extra that I had, the, the strength, endurance levels, got me to pull across and I hardly bowl a ball on the leg stump. So you never went back to county cricket and this must have been when, around 1990, 1990, yeah, 19, 1990, 19, yeah, 1989, yes, I was after my first year army, yeah, just before my first year army I went. Yeah, it's in that era. That's correct. And um, but I needed. I, uh, we started playing a lot of cricket in those days, and I wasn't the athlete like Alan Donald yes. to accommodate county cricket and local cricket. I, my body just wouldn't have made it. I wasn't a natural runner. I think you can remember how I used to run. Uh, I wasn't the best as best athlete in the system, and and it probably suited me not to have played more county cricket. And uh, and and so obviously at that point of in time, South Africa was in a state of flux. This was just when things were starting to change dramatically. And 
the importance of that was that it was having a massive effect on, on sport because I suppose around that era, this was, let's call it just before the unbanning of political parties and the start of that process, uh, 1989, that getting tour, the ill-fated rebel tour, sort of that put an end to rebel tours. Am I right? Yeah. I was also playing um, under Jimmy Cook in those days. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of games, and, and then the rest of the tour was cancelled. It was sad for us that they tried to, to prove our way into the system. Um, uh, interesting era. I remember um, Ali Bacha giving me a ring, saying to me, Fan, we're going to get back into international cricket. You're one of the players that's most probably going to make the site, or that's got a chance to make the site. Make sure that you've got a winter cricket program running because we're going to get back into international cricket. So I, I had a baby of six weeks old, um, started the family, and uh, spoke to the missus and said, let's find a place in England to play for the off-season. Got a club down south, um, left my work, left everything like this, uh, went ov <coughs> over, did a lot of training, a lot of fitness. Interesting thing happened. Can you remember a guy called Trevor Packer? Yes. My goodness. Yeah. I mean, he was like Archer. Yeah. Uh, that plays cricket now. He yeah. had an easy run up and he had a Very whip strong gather. And he, yeah, unbelievable gather. I mean, how many people in the world both at that pace with a mm. slow run up? He mm. could do it, Archer could do it, and a couple of others mm. um, that I've, I can count them on one hand. I actually phoned him and I said, Trev, um, did you get a phone call from me? He says, no, no. I said, let's go. Let's go both. Let's, uh, because I was looking for a training partner. <coughs> and if you go to England, if you know cricket in England, it's weathery, it's cold, it's. Uh, it's winter, if you want to call mm. it. Uh, it's a flipper nightmare to practice on your own. And he said, no, you're fine. I'm, you know, I, just started, I just started working for a company, and I've got a family, and I've got a bond. And I've got so he didn't go. And I can tell you now, he would have been, he probably would have taken my place if he went with me. Because in that six months in England, I became stronger, fitter. I was running hills. Um, I was doing shuttles. I had strong legs when I got back. And... And I found over my career, the stronger I got, the more I got to pull it across, the more the wrist went into position where it even swung more. So when I came back, I was an obvious choice in the system. Broke a foot just before the 92 World Cup. Uh, Ezra Mosey bowled me on my foot with reverse swing balls that he was scratching against the wall to reverse swing. And uh, he did it against me as a tailing batsman. Stupid. Um, but needless to say, missed that uh, original one or two games. Merrick Pringle went, went when, when I was fit enough. Obviously, I was back into the system. Yeah. Because, I mean, it wasn't like you were, I mean, there was quite a waiting list. There was quite a, a crop of bowlers at that point, right, led by Alan yeah. Donald. But, but there were quite they, a few really good uh, bowlers yeah. as well. I think if they looked at stats, yeah. it was easy to be to look at stats and see who's the guy that's taking the most wickets and going for the least runs. Yeah. So you get popular choices, Yeah. Um, popular left-handed choices, yeah. which is absolutely shocking from, from certain selectors that, that they put a put more emphasis on left-handers and looking at their mediocre results and then, okay, we need a left-hand tear away. Yeah. Okay, well, let's pick this up. And they, they've done that many a time. Yeah. You just look at stats. Stats proves how good you are, how many wickets you can take and at what runs you go at. Mm. And if more selectors can do that, uh, there will be less emotional selections. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then I recall then we heading towards the big moment, which was the trip to Australia in 93, 94, right? That, that summer. And you weren't an automatic selection necessarily. You didn't go as a first choice. Bowler. What happened is the media pushed me as a one-day player. Yeah. My best and his record wasn't good enough at all to be saying, Fani de Villiers is a, only an exponent of one-day cricket. Of, uh, it wasn't the case. Look at my record. I had some seasons I took 10, 15 more than the best of the South Africans in, in a season. Um, I wasn't the best looking fast bowler, <laughs> uh, and I'm talking facial too, uh, but uh, athletic wise I wasn't the best that, that, that was around, but stats should prove yeah. where you are. Um, and I was very surprised. In actual fact, the whole family, dad knew his cricket, and, and even the people around me said, you're taking the most wickets, and how come you're not in the system? Mm. So they were well, mm. emotional writers, and yeah. educators, writers, I'm not sure what you want to yeah. call it, but... Uh, from the first game, I proved that I should have been there in any case. Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the first test is obviously the Sydney test, right? No, the, the fir first one was, was Melbourne rained out. Rained out at Melbourne. And then there was the Sydney test. Yes. And uh, um, 
were you an automatic selection at that point? Well, I was selected. Um, yes, I was. But I was selected in the Melbourne Test match already. And, and I wanted to say the loud is about flipping time they select me. Mm. They selected Brett Schultz before me in, in Sri Lanka. Sri, and Sri Lanka yeah. just came into the international circuit. Uh, they couldn't add short, short pitch bowling. Mm. Uh, they were still yeah. caring and cushing most of the time. Um, uh, Brett got an injury and obviously uh, I was back into the system and, and, and wasn't really dropped any, any time any after time that. After. So uh, I thought I was. If you look at if you look at wickets taken per year, if you look at what I, if you look at what I got right, and and now I was a way swinger that could swing the old ball, which mm. they needed desperately. Craig Matthews wasn't the old ball swinger. Brian McMillan was an old ball swinger, or at pace at least. Arnold Dunga was never. Alan Dalt was never a swing bowler. Yeah. So you need a swing bowler. So in that category, I thought I was a, a normal selection. Papers might have said different. Yeah. I wasn't in South Africa that you might have read, but uh, um, uh, luckily. Again, luckily, we we had that season in England where I didn't do too well, where the ball couldn't swing. And that whole season, I just bowled off-cutter mm. after off-cutter after off-cutter to try and get LBWs and Nick left-handers off. And if you remember well, uh, I was the only real exponent of proper off-cutters. I had so many interviews mm. of cricket uh, writers coming to me and asking me about this off-cutters that I'm bowling for left-handers and for LBWs because everybody's expecting the ball to swing. Um, and that pulled me through in the Sydney Test match. Yeah. I don't so think I took one wicket with a way swing bowling. Everything was just off-cutters. Now, that was obviously one of the most uh, incredible moments, probably the top moment in South African cricket, and you know, as good as anything that the country has done. And, and uh, sometimes you just, uh, you know, obviously time dims that kind of achievement, and everybody believes that the current good player, whoever that would be, is the best player of all time. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you can't do that. But that was a hell of a... If I, can, if I can take you back quickly, I think um, to explain the game, you, you get a lot of wonderful cricket matches at the Oval or at Lords or in Calcutta, you know, the, the biggest mm. venues in the world, yeah. uh, the most well-known venues, um, even Melbourne with 113,000 people that can watch the game. Uh, but very seldom you get to a game where there is so much in mo emotion involved that it overshadows everything. Hmm. Um, it overshadows the Lords, it overshadows hmm. uh, 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 Calcutta, it overshadows anything you do. And the only way to get there is if something extraordinary happens. Hmm. And if it and that touches emotion. And you must remember Australia was number one in the world in those days. We were the Cinderella team yep. just getting into the system. And uh, suddenly we had uh, a game we, that lasted our 15 sessions of two hours lasted only 13 sessions and we probably lost about 11 of those sessions and we won the test match. Yeah. Now that's emotional. That's coming back from behind to win a test yeah. match and that's where the emotion comes in. Hence the reason that you're probably referring or alluding to it as, as, as one of the best uh, yeah. of a lot of games that you've seen because there was serious emotion involved. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it was made, uh, obviously, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's the way that, that, that the story unfolds, right? which is what you're alluding to. That first uh, test in, in, in Melbourne, uh, it, it looked like it was men against boys. They were ahead the whole way and the well, rain. We couldn't take a wicket. In actual couldn't fact, take we struggled to take wickets because we were bowling outside of them. We yeah. didn't attack at all. We were so scared of getting into international cricket, losing out on 20 years of experience outside, that we, we were too scared to bowl straight. Yeah. We had the idea, bowl out for Austin, let them chase the ball and get themselves out. Yeah. And they just left all the time yeah. um, and, and get their eyes in and they could start playing. So we and made a mistake in our tactics. And of course, they had uh, the, the magnificent Shane Warne at the start of his career. He had just come back from that Ashes series where he mesmerized England. And they were certainly mesmerizing us. Glenn McGrath was on the number. McDermott, uh, they had a good day. They, they had a hell of an attack, and yeah. and all these uh, war brothers, war brothers, and all these bad Border, the captain, yeah. Dean so Jones. Oof. It was a hell of a team, and uh, South Africa goes out, uh, doesn't bat so well. Australia bat better. South Africa doesn't bat so well, and ends up having to uh, Australia going to knock off 117. From can you remember how important role Jonty's knock played? Yeah. Yeah. He got a 70 odd, 72, yeah. 78. Against I think. the world, yeah. And, and, and luckily he got runs. 
to give us at least something, something to, to bowl. At. And I remember opening the well, uh, starting the bowling with Alan. Um, I took that evening four wickets. Yes. They were four down for sixty odd. Yes. And uh, and and the amount of overs that we bowled, I realised that these guys were going to knock it off. We all said they're going to knock it off in singles. They can't mm. go for fours. Mm. It's holding back again. Spinners, spinners, wicket. See, I took thirteen wickets in that test match. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I knew that we had a little bit more overs to mm. bowl the next day than than what a sixty or seventy runs that they needed allowed them to have. So uh, it just worked out well for us. So I think that's a. A wonderful marketing time for the African cricket it was. It was, yeah. So um, we all wake up nice and early, and uh, I'll never forget a moment that, that made the thing really special. I think it was uh, Mnet that were, were broadcasting that particular game, and there was an interview done by a commentator, really not a very good commentator by my recall, a South African guy who has went over to cover the thing. His name escapes me. And he didn't interview. Tony Greg. No, no, no. Uh, uh, oh, another one of ours. Sorry. One of ours, okay. yeah. And he uh, he still uh, interviewed Greg Chappell, who always looks like he's just sucked a bag of lemons. He's not exactly the happiest looking guy in the world. And they said to him, you know, interviewing these guys before play starts, what do you think South Africa's chances are? And he looked quite strangely at this question and he said, what to win this match? He said, yes. He says, well, I suppose on a scale of one to ten, they've got naught chance yeah. of winning this. I remember this. he said something like, uh, is they've got a million to one chances to win this test yeah. match. Yeah. So, That's yeah, what I heard. And, I and it was at, at that moment you thought, okay, you know, as, as a hopeful spectator, maybe they are overconfident uh, here. Maybe there's thing, And they lost a couple of early wickets because those four wickets the night before, which were crucial, you didn't take them up front. You took them uh, uh, quite close to the end, isn't it? Suddenly there was a, I mean, because I think they, if I'm not mistaken, they had a reasonable opening or second wicket stand. And, uh, you know, suddenly is four wickets down. It wasn't yeah. nothing. It wasn't, they weren't 60 for nothing. As I said, it cut us in a day walk. <laughs> yeah. I know it, 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 it definitely set the game up. And Alan Donald the next day, yeah. um, that LBW against the, Mark Wall. Well, it was, it was first when he, he bowled. Oh, no, it was the LBW first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the border too, you're talking about yeah. the border wicket. Yeah, no, it was wonderful. I, I think those, that specific game paved the way for South African cricket more than people think. Mm. Um, I think you need, you need a marketing stunt, marketing stunt mm. in any team. That was the marketing stunt. That mm. was what put us on a map. Yes, of course, the, the 22 runs, one ball scenario yeah. in the World Cup just before then already kind of lifted the eyebrows, but that game was a proof of, hey, you've got a South African cricket is back online again. So mm. I think if you if you got to go on a scale of one to 10, uh, what was the biggest marketing spiel for South African cricket um, uh, up until today? Yeah. You would probably go that, that um, uh, in actual fact, you're going to go three ways. You're probably going to go that 22 runs, one ball against England. That was a very strong side. You got to you got to think about the John T. Rhodes dive. Mm. Uh, that that was also a hell of a marketing mm. um, stunt, and then uh, what we did at Sydney. I think yeah. that paved the way for us. Paved the way for sponsorships. Paved yeah, the way for imagine. everything. I just yeah. wish. On my way here, I was thinking about a, a, a meeting that I was asked by Hans uh, by uh, um, uh, the management to go with Hansi to speak to the businessman of South African of South Africa. Ali Bacher was then, and I there I should have said. South African cricket is is one of the best marketing tools that one can get. You guys must piggyback on the players, on the on on, on what South African cricket and where they're going to in the future, because it proved mm -hmm. that the marketing ability of the players uh, was just fantastic. If you really think about the ambassadorship that took place over that time, yeah, um, it was brilliant. Now. Okay, so that must have been, a, I mean, uh, you know, it was just an unbelievable, must have been an unbelievable moment to have done, achieved what you achieved, being carried off the ground by Hansi Cronier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there's a beautiful song. Um, Donna Winner sings a song, and I, I invite people to, to go on YouTube and, and look at the uh, Donna Winner um, uh, song where she sings about one moment in time. I mean, that's special. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Every sportsman, every team are looking for one moment in time where you can 
stamp your authority down that it helps you for marketing purposes that helps you for selection policies later on it helps you for it helps you with everything mm. and that was my moment and i and, and and i'm very i'm very humble to 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 be on the receiving end of that i think a lot of players go through our career without a moment in time yeah and uh, and and uh, yes it was special um it also it also i remember getting a phone call from dad that evening um he was still in south africa and he said to me my boy You've just put a lot of pressure on yourself now. Now it's you to prove that you can stay at this level. Yes. Because you've achieved something. It's easy to have a, f a, a, a dip now. Now, even more than ever, you need to start working harder and mm. harder and harder at your game to become more all-rounded in your, in your specific um, uh, professional side of bowling and make sure you never fall behind because now more than ever you need to prove. And for the rest of your career, you did. But I, I want to go uh, just to ask you one last question about the Sydney uh, thing. Was that I know what the South African response was. It was mayhem. We could, I think it was more stunned initially than anything else that we could actually pull it off. But what was the, what was the feeling like in Australia? I think your 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 better sportsmen, hmm. your guys that get selected, are really good realists. They uh, understand success ratios. They understand luck ratios. They understand how volatile the game can be both ways. Um, uh, your good sportsman is a realistic sportsman. He's not somebody that's going to cry and he's on the top of his bat. He also didn't make runs, bec but he, it's because he knows hmm. what the percentages are that you're yeah. actually chasing. And, and some of your better players, one out of three times you get a pat on the shoulder. Some mm. of your reasonable players, one out of five times. Mm. And some players that stays in the system for a long time, one out of ten times is good mm. enough to be in the team. So it's not a high ratio like, like tennis or golf where you're in the top ten and you always, you, every single game you're going to be mm. more or less there. So uh, I think we were realist more than anything else. Um, I think we realized for the first time that we can compete. Um, the uncertainty that we had in Melbourne and not even knowing exactly what the line was to attack i mean if you think mm. about somebody that's nervous and just to explain it to the public if you are nervous young sportsman you're not going to play to the full of your ability mm. you're going to be holding back a bit because mm. you don't want to make mistakes mm. and if you can get to the point where you know you're going to get selected or you know there's a bit of a frame of reference that you can actually win games from here you are going to attack more and you are going to play the 100 percent of your capacity otherwise you played 80 percent just to look after the system you're too scared to make mistakes and for the first time we realized um that we can actually play good cricket. A defining moment on that tour was actually against New Zealand in the World Series. Mm. Um, we didn't, we weren't going to qualify for the finals. Um, we, New Zealand and Australia, were in the triangular, and uh, and and we sat down. We had to play um, New Zealand in a one-day game, a 50-over match, um, and we haven't beaten them before. We struggled to beat them. They Patel and the great bats hitting the ball at start. Great Patch was a pathfinder in the, in, mm. the, in the evolution of, of hitting the ball hard from an opening perspective. And we sat down and said, boys, we've just won the Sydney Test match a while back. We can prove that we can beat the best in the world. Why don't we go out and try and beat New Zealand in 26 overs? Not 50 overs, 26 overs. And that's what we need to qualify. And I can tell you now, everybody at home, everybody in the world said, there's no way that they can actually beat New Zealand. And we, we beat them in, I think, 27 overs. And luckily, Australia messed up the next game and we qualified. Mm. But a team that we haven't won before, that we, that we struggled to cope with, we said, let's go there and play the game as if we're the best in the world and try and beat these guys within 26 overs. And we did. So, so that, that kind of, of psychology yes. you get from a Sydney game. You get from frame of references that that's positive, that belief. And, and, and a lot of Afrikaners, for that matter, had to go through a lot before we can actually break into. And the likes of Corey van Sale, Hubert mm. uh, Sale, and Adam myself, kind of path the way for frame of references to say, mm. listen, we can also make it. Mm. And that's typically what happened to Sydney. Okay, but I want to now pick up on two other moments that were heroic moments. And, and I think, in a way, unfairly Sydney overshadowed those heroic moments, right? Because they were almost, as, a, as, an in, as somebody that, that sort of loves the game, were almost as heroic. And one was uh, the next test, the one in Adelaide, when yeah. you batted for so long. 
Yeah, we had to try and play for a draw there. Yes. Mm. And uh, the top order having a lot of problems with Shane Warne. And South Africa were cruising to the loss. And we had to bat out two sessions with, I think, only about two or three wickets in hand. Yeah, what happened is I went in as night watch, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. You that's right. I went morning. in as night watch. And, and, and at club cricket, I was batting four and five. Yes. So, uh, you could, have, you cricket, could hold it back. I wasn't scared. Let's yeah. put it that way. I was realistic enough not to chase wide deliveries outside of the way I tried to get guys to follow that. Yeah. I was realistic enough to go on a hook and, 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 and the cut anything straight over the top or down the line I could play so I was I was strong enough to stand my ground and that's exactly what I did hence the reason that they asked me to do the night watchman job um better th with with uh, the night before and then I had a broken thumb and uh, injections uh, um, and and every every like hour and a half I had an injection to kill the pain again and that started getting to me to be honest but the reality was I ended up batting with uh, Peter Kirsten hmm. till till just before drinks, just before tea. Yeah. The drink session before tea. Yeah. And we had to bat through. But we were on the receiving end of Darrell Hare. Yeah. We were on the receiving end of another umpire yeah. that 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 gave seven wickets out. LBW yeah. and stuff that I think it wasn't out. It's probably one or two was out, but it was really terrible yeah, decisions. We were we were robbed. Uh, we could have beaten in that series the best team in the world and we should have done that. I mean, if I, as a as a novice batsman, can hang around and uh, for for four or five hours batting, then anybody could have done that. But mm. yeah, it was a nightmare. It's a sad moment and it's a sad turnaround of that. I scored 32 in that yes. match. I think I, was, I, I batted a couple of hundred balls, if a hundred balls or even more. But uh, the advice I remember playing and missing the first one of Shane Warne. I looked at at, at Boone, and I looked at Steve Wall, Ach Mark Wall. And they just smiled at me, <laughs> and the next one, play and miss again. So uh, I said to I said to uh, the boys, "Hey boys, I need some coaching here. Help me out. What <laughs> must I do?" So they both chuckled, uh, had a chuckle, and and Mark was said to me, "Just play it straight. Just don't follow it. Just play straight." And that's what I did. <laughs> I just kept on playing. I never followed it, and I played straight for the for the for the um, flipper. And every time I got that. Yeah. on the middle of the bat and the spin just spun away and, yeah. and, and every time it spun i just left it you know i just yeah. didn't follow it <coughs> and, and we talked about it obviously later on with the coaching that i received there <laughs> on the because they never realized it was going to bat so long <laughs> i think if they would have lost that match one of them would have been fired or dropped uh but it's 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 a long day we showed some guts yes i think that's what you want to allude to yeah. I, it would be remiss of me not to to talk about the gutsy um, uh, John T. Rhodes mm. and Pat Simcox bowling all those overs in that specific match and Kepler Vessels playing with a compound fracture kept on batting mm. um, you remember he wasn't on the field the last mm. day because Hansi took over as captain um, a lot of gutsy players that we had around us and yeah. uh, it epitomizes the South African I way I always felt that, uh, that um, John T. Rhodes was never given the credit that he was due for the kind of guts he would show under those circumstances. It's the kind of guy you want in your dressing room, it seemed to me. The kind of guy that you want on the other side when you bat, because yes. he steals so many singles that somebody else wouldn't have taken running to the danger end. He stopped so many extra runs. I reckon he was worth 30 runs before a match even started, mm. but before he even picked up a bat. Yeah, he was, uh, to, to the way I saw it, probably the first victim of uh, the idea that he was just a one-day player. Uh, and, and, you know, because I watched him play, make a century at Lord's. Um, that was, I think, after he got dropped and he got back yeah. into the system again. I think we need to be, we need to be realistic about averages. Yes. Um, we need to be realistic about the 20 years that we didn't play. We, uh, if you look at the averages of our players in those days, who, how many of them would have made World Eleven teams, mm. if you look at averages? But then it's unfair to look at averages if they only started their careers at 28, 29, 30, yeah. or 24, 25, 26. <coughs> um, the reality was that, that we were out of, out of the international circuit for quite a while. Um, Base and Hedges cricket, oof, what a, I wish we could have had a chat just about uh, that and the marketing ability that, that the Base and Hedges brought to the table. And now the stadiums were sold out and, mm. and how effective it was. Uh, but a lot we didn't know. Yeah. Can you remember when Amre of uh, India started double stepping Kuri and yeah. and and, and um, uh, Omar Henry? Yeah. Every single ball out the crease hit him over the top wherever. It we never used to do that. 
Yeah. And it shows you if you're not if you're not um, if you're not part of the international well, circuit, you actually miss out. Well, I mean, I was just just sort of just to 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 roll forward, I was I was quite surprised with the recent IPL. You, you know, Heinrich Klaassen, who had a wonderful series in the IPL. Uh, you know, and he, he was sort of being acknowledged by the end of the series as the best player of spin. And I can't help for somebody uh, who, who sort of lived through that era to say, geez, I remember a time when we could really barely play spin. Exactly. And now you've got a South African, Afrikaans South African, playing in the IPL in India, being voted as, rated as the best player of spin. How the world changes, it's quite, ama it's quite it amazing. It shows you access to yeah, access to Indian cricket, access to IPLs, access to those wickets, access, access, access. Yeah. Um, if if we can have our SAA side touring more, we would we would create better players. So pity the money is not always there to support them. But uh, Heinrich, with all the years that he's played, he's quite an old boy in comparison yeah. with youngsters. How long does it take that evolution to actually get to understand it better and easier? You you get so many players from Ackerman right through to so many others that admitted over the years that they were selected too early to play for South Africa. Yes. If they could only have started playing when they were 28, 29, 30, they would have been better yeah. players, better averages, better success, better. Probably the best uh, example of that was the Aussie. Um, uh, Hussey. Sorry? Hussey. Yes, Mike Hussey, who made his debut after the age of 30. Uh, I think he had like about eight seasons where he literally dominated the world. You're seeing it at the moment uh, with Scott Boland. And these guys come into their career late, but they've worked out a lot of the kinks. They know where their strengths lie. They know where their weaknesses lie. Mm. And, uh, you know, hopefully this, this age of, of just an, uh, this era of age obsession is, is over. Yeah, you, the problem is your selectors. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> Let's not start the discussion, not start the discussion on, on, the, on the knowledgeable selectors that we have. Yeah, it's funny, you know, we're going to sit here all day, but I just, uh, I know that, uh, you know, we, we're going to have to um, start finishing up. I just want to then roll forward and have a look at where we are now. Right, not, not quite now. I want to touch on one thing that you were instrumental on. And, uh, you know, the new cycle is short and people forget. But that big incident that we had with Australia when they were tampering with the ball, you were the guy that, that realized something was wrong and you were the guy that directed the cameras to following the ball. Am I right? Yeah, what happened is I didn't commentate the first match. And if you know, if you know reverse swing bowling mm -hmm. and if you try to do reverse swing bowling in South Africa many a time, from provincial cricket to international cricket, um, and you, you could get it right in other countries, you know how it works. So the first test match that I wasn't doing, I was looking at the reverse swing they got in the 23rd to 26th to 27th. I thought, it's impossible. And if I can explain it quickly, if you've got a grass covering like you get in South Africa, the ball doesn't scuff up in that. It's impossible to scuff up the ball to, to the extent sort of slides where on it the becomes grass, so rough that it starts reverse swinging. Mm. So you get reversing two ways. The first one is to wet the one side, the the shiny side so much that it stops swinging and then it starts going the other way because of the weight this is a shiny side going that way all right so you start wetting it when it stops swinging, you start wetting that side and that's how you get reverse swing in south africa by wetting the one side to make it heavier then it starts going bowls you know that way yeah the other way is to scuff it up and south african wickets don't allow scuffing up because there's too much grass covering on it in in all the in most cases even if you see just a tinge it's just enough not just to eat the ball up so you have to scratch the ball some way to get reversing, which is what Pakistan did in our country. We got reversing through wet, they got reversing through scratching before they started checking. I've got the proof at home with my last six balls that I played against Pakistan. But needless to say, um, uh, when we became part of that, it was already discussed, how can they get reverse swing? Uh, I was phoned by one or two people that was commentating, and obviously on the Afrikaans side, we spoke about it all the time, that there is something going on. Uh, myself and Heisman used to always sit uh, sit with the camera people, not our little cubicle for the commentators. We used to have lunch with our own guys. And a lot of discussion was taking place in that circles. And, and already in that one test match, they were trying to look at um, uh, Warner with uh, the, uh, the plaster over his hand. And um, yes, I was definitely part of that. It was a super sport production. 
uh, it was said in our ears when I started talking about the reverse swing, how impossible it is to do it on the Afrikaans side. Even the, the producer talked about having a look here, check this, I can check that. I said, I was definitely not the one to go to a cameraman and say, listen, you must check. It was a super sport production. I'm not taking it away from me mm. or from anywhere else. But uh, the one guy that found them at the end, that found it, it's fantastic. What a what a good moment for super sport it was when we caught them. Uh, and it was just absolutely silly. And, and the proof was in the pudding. When you, I did an interview uh, directly after the match that I, that, that, that um, uh, in Australia on the radio saying that we caught them out and we were looking for them and whatever the case might be. I never in that interview said I, luckily I said we as a mm. super sport. Um, and they weren't too happy on the receiving side that, that they guys were cheating. Um, that caused a bit of havoc in the super sports circles, but uh, the accolades definitely went to the cameraman that, that actually tried to find it. It was so obvious between the super sport production that these guys were, were doing it in, in, in a different way um, that it worked out well for, for South African cricket at that yeah. stage, not and, for them. And how do you feel as somebody who was part of, uh, of that discussion that led to what it led to? The fact that, uh, you know, I, certainly as a, as a cricket fan, I felt that, uh, you know, I feel that the treatment was very generous to those Aussie players. Yeah, the coach should have got fired immediately. The coach should have, and, and, and you, you know, when you look at, when you go back in history and in other circumstances, how some cricketers have been banned, fined, this, that, the other, you know, it's this it's is politics. the ultimate this is the ultimate betrayal isn't it for yeah, what's happening game? in south african politics who gets fired yeah you get away with it so who's the strongest in world cricket australia and india they'll get away with it i'm sure in most cases well they got yeah. away with it yes exactly yeah. so in a case like that um uh, the bowlers are the most guilty yeah they must have uh played a big part in mobilizing the fielders to do that um uh, warner definitely we know that now um, poor Bancroft, yeah. again. He poor paid, he's Bancroft. the only one who paid a bit of a price. Um, but the coach, yeah. it starts at the coach. And it starts at, at possibly what's been happening in state cricket yeah. in Australia. That's probably where it started and it ends up on the international circuit. So I hope they had a look at state cricket records too because if you look at Stark's record after <coughs> the scratching versus yes. uh, the scratching, his whole career dipped yeah. when, it, uh, when it goes to the amount of wickets that he took. I have to say, it did lead <coughs> to what could be the funniest tweet I've ever seen. It was straight after that, and somebody tweeted that uh, the tweet went something along the lines of, the guy I feel most sorry for is Mitchell Stark. This poor guy thought he was Wasim Akram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder how many wickets those guys would have taken if, if the ball was scrutinized yeah. earlier in our careers. So, finally, we've... Uh, we've we could carry on forever, and uh, we just uh, just want to wrap it up uh, by asking you uh, about cricket as it is now. Mm. Right? There's so many more things we could discuss, but times against us. So, you know, this past year, this past season, we had the SA20. South Africa seems to have been relegated roughly to a second division within Test cricket because it seems like you've got the A division being England, India, and Australia. And, uh, you, you know, we, we are not the most popular country uh, to, to seemingly in world cricket. Uh, and our, obviously our commercial value has declined as the country's economy has declined. Yeah, some, some tournaments haven't even got a sponsor. Yeah. Um, you know what I would rather worry about mm. um, than making a statement on where our cricket is? Uh, we should think about the young players that sees the IPL this young little batsman Brevis. that gets a little cricket bat for his first, second, third birthday and he goes to school and he goes to the nets and there's 170 kids turning up and only the school only allows two teams to play and the other 140, 50 gets sent back home. That's what we should be worried about. But in the same, um, in the same breath. Uh, breath, cricket has become a global game. It's become a, a wonderful global game. I've decided my boy um, was going to play cricket in New Zealand. Um, he's, he's carved out a wonderful career for him. He bowled his last ball in anger this season. Um, uh, he's, he's living the life in a first world country with a wonderful exchange rate. Um, 
I wouldn't say it's a better country than ours. We love our country. But he can come back with those dollars one day if he wants to. So the advice of for the people that's really worried about South African cricket and their boys' cricket, cricket is a global game. Cricket has opened up the doors. How positive is it that some of our boys get forced to go in dollars and pounds and and, 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 and uh, whatever the currency of, of the colonial countries are. I've even sent my boy, to, my boy to Barbados for a season to go and play cricket there. And what a wonderful world it opened up. Um, just breaking down the barriers that we think that we can only play cricket here. Uh, New Zealand, England, Australia, uh, there are four or five countries that play cricket in our season and only England really in the off-season. For the guys to get forced sometimes because of the intricacies of so many cricket players that one can select out of. Remember the Afrikaners when they came in, how many English players didn't make the teams in those days? Mm. They went to play cricket in England, mm. am I right? Mm. Or Australia, or it mm. opens up the world for mm. these guys. We've got four or five hundred youngsters playing cricket overseas these days and, and, and making a living out of it and, and getting a wonderful education and the perception of first world versus third world is exactly what I want our children to go through. Mm. So for the parents and the people that stop their kids from playing cricket because of the perception of quotas or the perception of politics or the perception of only the top cricketing schools kids getting selected or the perception of the top schools selectors are at the um, uh, on the selection panels hence the reason that they don't get selected from Pretoria North boys to not getting selected because uh, two other schools have got the selectors on the panel it doesn't matter cricket mm. is a global game after school you can go and 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 get educated in the world of uh, university of life degree mm. for that matter that we want our kids to go through um, and that's what i'm going to do with my other boys too they're going to go they have to go they have to go and find out seeing the wider horizons then come back to south africa if they want to and they'll be successful yet to most probably the second point is that let's let's say that because of selection policies um english versus afrikaans afrikaans versus doesn't matter what you don't get selected uh, uh, the, the, the chances of you getting and becoming good overseas is just as good. Because if you can't make the top three, four, five of your team right now, who says you're going to become a good cricketer? A lot of people make up the team. Mm. Most of them don't make it. A few of us did make up the team and got better. A few. Can't use an exception as a rule. But most guys, that doesn't, th that, that's not the normal selection of the two, three best batsmen, two, three best bowlers. They're never going to make it in any case. And and if they were going to make it and they miss out here, they will make it overseas. Mm. So you've got a certain certain philosophy um, around a sportsman to be inquisitive and teachable and, and hardworking and, and disciplined. And they can go and do it there and also achieve it. And they will achieve it easier in actual fact than mm. in South Africa that's got seriously good sporting schools. Uh, they've got club cricketers overseas trying to make it. Mm. Our schools are the best in the world when it comes to generating young sportsmen and you can immediately go get into a system and excel. Well, what a wonderful time that the sport that we knew, which you look back to uh, when we were playing cricket, we weren't playing together, but at the time, uh, the sport was so limited. What you're talking about is the fact that it's now a global game. There's big markets that are interested in, in cricket. There's wonderful opportunities, but Fani de Villiers, you've given us so much joy on the field. You, you've given us so much joy in the selection box and you've given me a lot of joy by joining me here today. Thank you so much for coming through. It really has been great to talk to you and we've got to do this again. To everybody that's watched this, please subscribe to our channel. We're going to bring more and more sports heroes, legends here to talk to. Fani, thank you so much for joining us today. The next time we do it in Afrikaans. The next time we'll do it in Afrikaans. I can speak Afrikaans, but sometimes I just might need a beer or two first. <laughs> And then I speak fluent Sorry Afrikaans. Sorry about the tenses that I got <laughs> wrong a couple of times. <laughs> thank you so much, Fani, and thank you to everybody that's joined us.